Welcome everyone. I'm Pam Cole with the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and I'd like to welcome you to today's Energy Code Commentator webinar. It's on ASHRAE 90.1 2013 and the IECC 2015, a review of lighting requirements. We hold a webinar the second Thursday of every month at the same time, so keep watch out on the Building Energy Code training webpage as topics get added. If you have any topic suggestions, you'd like us to consider, please email them to us using the email in your webinar reminder messages. Our speaker today is Eric Richmond. He is also from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and we really appreciate him taking the time to share the information on the lighting code requirements with us today. Eric, go ahead. It's all yours. Thanks, Pam, and uh, good morning or good afternoon, whichever part of the country you're from. Um, as Pam mentioned, this is on ASHRAE 9401 2013 and IECC 2015, a review of lighting requirements. And uh, this is a review. In other words, not every little detail that's in the uh, code itself will be, will be uh, detailed in here. We just don't have that much time. Uh, but I do want to give you a flavor of what the requirements are, what you might have to look out for, even if you haven't adopted these or, or been faced with adopting these codes yet or not. A few learning objectives. Uh, what we really want to talk today are uh, an understanding of the basic requirements, so you understand what's coming in terms of what you have to look out for and maybe where to go to get more information about these two uh, codes if they're the ones you're having to deal with. I want you to become familiar with some of the development basis for some of the requirements because that's often asked is where did this come from and, and uh, why is it like it is. also like to provide as much as possible where I can some examples of acceptable paths to compliance or maybe some tricky issues you might want to uh, have some help with or have in your back pocket. And finally, a better understanding of, of the actual process of compliance that is used in real products, because that's real projects. If that's the reason you're here. You want to uh, make sure you're understanding how the how the the code, what the code requires, and how you can uh, be better at showing effective compliance. So a little bit of um, I'll call background why these two codes. They're somewhat linked together. Uh, ASHRAE 90.1 2013 is adopted in, in uh, some U.S. states, and it, because of its development uh, process and the organizations behind it, represents some of the latest uh, energy code requirements across the country, which provides a basis for most other existing energy codes in the country. A lot of the work that's done for ASHRAE 90.1 finds itself in one form or another in other codes, and vice versa. IEC 2015 is the most widely adopted energy code in the U.S., so it's important to that. It has many requirements that are identical or similar to 90.1-2013, so it's good to talk about both of them together. IECC 2015 also references directly 90.1-2013, an alternative compliance, compliance path. So again, the two are linked. This presentation, just to provide a, a consistent format, is based on the requirements of, of 90.1-2013, but we're going to notice differences, additions, deletions, etc. for 2015, so you get a flavor for, for both of them. A little more relevant background, 90.1 is jointly sponsored by ASHRAE and IES. IES, of course, the lighting part, Looming Engineering Society. It's developed by a whole group of volunteer engineers, builders, designers. Uh, the provisions are often adopted or modified for other codes. Current public well, is 90.1 2013, and there are other adopted and used in, in various states. IECC is developed by the International Code Council. Mem membership is primarily building officials. It is essentially a collection of provisions that have been developed or proposed by others, other uh, states, other organizations, codes. Its current version is 2015. Other versions, again, have been adopted and used in various states. The basis for why, why do we have these code requirements? Back in the 1990s, the Energy Conservation and Production Act, which has been further amended by EPAC, required that states adopt an energy code. And the Department of Energy was tasked with determining what level of each state had to adopt. And currently that's 90.1-2013. States then ad adopt or develop their own codes or standards to meet this requirement. That's why many of the versions are, are nationally available within various states because we've adopted different versions of the code. Some states, of course, develop their own code, and sadly, some states have no code yet. They've 
uh, been able to avoid having to comply with that to this point for, for various reasons. So it's quite a mixed bag out there. What we're showing you is the, the latest, greatest, which will give you an eye uh, for what you're having to deal with now or what you're likely to have to uh, deal with in the future. So let's go right into uh, the first part, which are the lighting power density limits. These are the things uh, most people are concerned about when they're looking at lighting energy codes. Uh, the space-by-space -space LPDs from the previous 90.1-2010 version have mixed changes. Some went up, some went down for, for various different reasons, and I'll explain a little bit of that later on. The building area LPDs, because they're an aggregate of all the different spaces in a building, most of those stayed about the same, a few being reduced. Uh, 90.1-2013 did add some new spaces, a few minor ones, plus a set of spaces specifically for the visually impaired. And this would be nursing home, retirement home kind of, of areas. And these generally have higher LPD allowances because older generations and people with visually impaired issues, impairment issues, need additional lighting. But these higher LPD allowances are very restricted. In other words, they can only be for facilities that meet a certain criteria, including being designed to uh, an IES design guide RP28. So they're, they're, they're very restricted. Uh, the LPD limits for IECC 2015 for whole building, they're identical. They're the same as 2013. For um, the space type LPDs, they're mostly the same, a few exceptions. IECC 2015 has a couple of lower numbers, hospital corridors and dining areas for the visually impaired. They just decided they um, could do with less or, or it was more appropriate to use a lower number. But they're higher for a couple of others, electrical mechanical room and for sales area. Again, the IECC group decided um, those were appropriate for their stair going forward. But the rest of them are all uh, identical, so they're a pretty close match. We often get asked, where do these LPDs come from? There's always been concern that, gosh, you keep ratcheting them down, they get tighter and tighter and tighter and lower and lower and lower, and where's it going to stop? Um, the, the point I want to make is that these aren't just a squeezing of the numbers or just simply picking a lower number. There's actually a very involved development basis for it. And uh, for, the, for the most part, for IECC and, and uh, 90.1, they're developed within the ASHRAE uh, process, the 90.19 subcommittee with some IES committee support. They're generated using some building space models, about 120 different space type models, using the IES lumen method calculation and applying a whole bunch of inputs. Current performance data on uh, efficient products, uh, current uh, light loss factors for those efficient, generally cost-effective products, latest IES and A recommended light levels, and sometimes they, those do change, and so those will affect what the LPD values are. And of course, there's a lot of professional consensus of quality lighting in environments that's used in the models to make sure um, lighting quality can be preserved. These elements and some others are combined into the models to come up with a lighting power density. And the ISAS recommended light levels and professional consensus ensure that when you're faced with these LPDs, you can design and provide good quality lighting and still comply with the energy code using reasonably efficient, cost-effective products. That's the idea. So what about the whole building LPDs? There are 120 some models for space types. What about whole building? These are generally based directly from those space models. There's a lot of data that's been uh, taken from real building plans. Yeah. Currently, it's a set of 87 buildings, representing 31 building types. And what happens is all the individual lighting power density values in those space types are aggregated into a whole building based on the space types that are in these real building sets of plans and takes averages over multiple buildings to come up with a whole building LPD. Technically, the way that works is that if you had a building that exactly had the same mix of space types as an average of all the 20, 30, whatever buildings in each of the building types, you would come up with exactly the same number if you did the space by space or whole building method. But you won't have exactly the same number, but it, it comes out pretty close to be the same. The advantage, of course, of the whole building method is that it's a lot simpler in terms of calculation. But anyway, that's that's where this uh, that's where these values come from. And of course, they're updated as as things change in in real time. Yeah. So an, another item that always gets asked about is what about LED technology because it's supposedly more efficient and it's the latest thing. And where do those fall on energy codes? Uh, the energy codes do limit the installed lighting power for interior and exterior. That's 
that's what they work. Uh, that's how they work. But they, the, the currently adopted codes, do not specify individual targets. No, there's an English code that. Everyone, make sure your lines are muted. Sorry to interrupt you, Eric. Thank you. Please, please along just, with all the vendor data coming in on a low level way. Yeah. Please, please, please mute your phone if you can. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, back to L LEDs and LPDs. Um, the currently adopted energy codes do not specify individual technologies. They don't say use this, use that, or don't use this, don't use that. Uh, and they don't currently include LED product efficacy <coughs> in the LED limit. They um, use a mix currently, for the most part, of efficient fluorescent and halogen type products. However, in the next version of 90.1, there will be LED technology as part of the driver for LPD limits, LPD limits. And this is simply the realization that over the years, LEDs have proven their efficacy and energy savings. They continue to be reduced in cost. And there are lots of products available that make good sense. So we'll, in the future, see uh, potentially lower LPDs based on LED technology. However, until uh, 90.1-2016, or maybe IECC-2018, or some other code are adopted with LED in the mix, uh, you will find that using LED, LED products will help you show compliance with LPDs because you will have a much more efficacious system. So that's just a few words about LEDs. In terms of the lighting power density limits, one thing that's important to remember are the exemptions. Currently in 90.1-2013, there are 18 exemptions. And I know it's small. You weren't meant to be able to read this. But <clears throat> excuse me, the point is that there are 18 different types of lighting. You don't have to count at all. And you want to make sure you don't count that stuff because you don't have to. They're for special purposes and they aren't part of the lighting power density limits. IECC 2015 has a similar set of exemptions, but you'll want to read them specifically to make sure you've got them right. They're very similar. And of course, um, compliance tools such as ComCheck or ResCheck or anything else for that matter may not perfectly um, represent these exemptions or may not list them as as uh, detailed as they are here. So you'll want to read the actual code and make sure you know that what you can exempt and what can't exempt. Find lots of times that people don't realize these are exempted, and so they end up counting those lots and they don't have to. So basically, don't leave those lots on the table. Make sure you're exempting whatever you're allowed to. There is, in 90.1-2013, a room cavity ratio adjustment. And this is put in there with the realization that some spaces are kind of odd or weird, or have strange geometries. And the lumen method calculation that I mentioned is the basis for LPDs is really meant for normal kinds of spaces. So there's an understanding that if you have a really weird space for whatever reason in terms of its geometry, you're going to have trouble meeting it with that lighting power density. So if you can show that your room cavity ratio, which is a calculation of your room's geometry, is higher than the threshold that's been determined by the code, you get a 20% allowance increase in your lighting power density to help you with that weird space. And separately, for corridor transition spaces, it's not the RCR. It's if you have a width less than eight feet, it turns out it's hard to do that, that, uh, that corridor. Now, I do want to note this, is, this adjustment is not included in IECC 2015. Of course, it's not like you're going to use a lot, but when it is needed to have, you may if you have a lot of weird spaces, you may have trouble. But, but that's the reason it's in here. And I'll show you later on where this uh, RCR threshold comes from. Here's a graphic representation, representation of how you calculate the RCR. And this is in the code. It's simply 2 and a half times the room cavity height times the room perimeter length, all of that divided by the room area. And this kind of gives you an idea of where that comes from. It's from work plane to luminaire height and it's the room area itself. So you do need to do this room by room. It's a space by space provision. You can't do it for a whole building and get 20% for the whole building. It's each individual space. Um, one other point on that, when you do it by each individual space, those extra watts gets added to your whole bucket of watts for your building. So when you calculate that you get an extra 20% of watts in that for, for what's in that space, and let's say that's another 500 watts, that 500 watts you can use anywhere in the building, but it's calculated based on that individual space. So, another um, item that's in both of the uh, both 90.1 and IECC are retail display allowances. 
And these have been around for many, many years with the realization that retail lighting display is quite variable and so um, something had to be done to allow it when it's being used. So these are allowances only for lighting that is to be installed and used to display merchandise. It has to be specifically for that only. And the allowance in, in 90.1 is 1,000 watts base plus, depending on what kind of retail you, area you have, a value per watts per square foot. And below you'll see the retail areas one through four kind of categories of what kind of merchandise it is. Now these are use it or lose it. In other words, you have to use this allowance only for those special luminaires that are aimed at merchandise. You can't use it for any kind of overhead lighting or anything else that's in the space. It has to be just for the, for the uh, spotlighting merchandise. One way to look at that is if you were to turn off um, all of the lights that were just for retail spotlighting and left on any lights you would use for just moving around in the space, even if they're double duty, those you have to count for compliance. So if you're using spotlighting to both highlight merchandise and provide a way for patrons to walk around, that lighting is general lighting and it has to be counted. You can't um, provide an allowance for something that's already used for general lighting. So you have to be careful of how you account for this. But it does provide quite a bit of, of wattage so that you can get that highlighting, um, uh, merchandise lighting put in place. The only difference here for IECC 2015, they have the same allowances, but they only provide a 500 watt base allowance instead of 1,000. So moving on to exterior lighting power. And as you may be familiar, the uh, allowances in, in most codes are, are provided in either a tradable, tradable surfaces and non-tradable surfaces. The reality is that like uh, interior, where you can trade watts between spaces, you, you get a bucket of watts for the building and you put them wherever you want. Similar with outdoor, you get a bucket of watts for the tradable surfaces and you can use them wherever you want within those tradable surfaces. But there are some specific places, non-tradable, where you are given a lighting allowance, but it's kind of like you use it or lose it. You have to use it for that surface or area. You can't trade that for something else. So if we look at the part of the table, this is the part of the table from um, 90.1, you'll see there is a base site allowance and it based on the, it's based on the zone you're in. And then for each uh, area type or application type, there is a separate allowance. And this is part of the tradable surfaces list. And you'll see it varies by zone. But again, this is just part of the list. The zone, uh, we often get asked about, well, how do I know which zone I'm in? And what the, the energy code developers did is looked at lighting zone descriptions, which are based on lighting design, not where you are on the map, and translated them into something that building officials and building um, owners could more understand. So here are descriptions as best as you can kind of lay it out of where you might be. So zone one is a developed area of a park, forest, or rural area, pretty much hardly any building there. Zone two and three are the most common ones, residential and mixed use neighborhood businesses, light industrial, limited night use. Uh, zone four is the highest one, high activity commercial. That might be downtown New York City kind of thing or the Vegas Strip, a lot of light, a lot of activity going on. So this is what the building official will use to help determine which zone you're in. And once you find out which zone you're in, that will determine which uh, set of requirements you have to go with. So for IECC, um, the values are the same with a few exceptions. IECC 2015 has slightly lower LPD allowances for building facade, and they do not include a few of the new categories in 90.1 2013. They don't include landscaping and loading docks. Those were two new ones that were added late in the 90.1 2013 process and weren't uh, picked up by, by ICC 2015. The rest of the requirements uh, turn out to be the same. So let's move on now to the lighting control requirements and we'll talk about the interiors first. Both 90.1-2013 and IECC have interior control requirements that are based on a space-by-space -space application with some exemptions. But they, they are treated space-by-space -space because every space has a different function and need. Uh, 2013 has adopted a tabular format for this, and I'll show you that, okay, um, that includes these control requirements along with uh, applicable LPD limits and um, 
separate definitions for each control type, just for uh, simplicity. IEC 2015 uh, still maintains for this version kind of a previous version of doing it, which has paragraphs and sections that define the code and define where it must be applied. Both have similar approaches to the control, but there are some differences, and I'll go through some of them here, at least the major ones. So again, I promise you the tabular format, you'll see that up at the top, kind of in the gray, uh, there is a, a reference to a control type, like the first one's local control, second one restricted to manual on, et cetera, et cetera. And there's one in yellow, which is a new one for 90.1. Off on the left, you see all the space types. This starts with the common space types. Down below on the table will be the individual building, specific building space types. There is the LPV value there, watts per square foot. Right next to it is the RCR, RCR threshold. Remember, we talked about the RCR adder or, or um, additional allowance. That's the threshold you have to meet. So, for example, in an audience seating area in a motion picture theater, if your RCR threshold is calculated at over four, then you get a 20% addition. That's the way that kind of works. And then you'll see across REQ means it's required. So in virtually every, every space type, you're required to have local control. And you're, in the case of the first one, you're required to have bi-level lighting control where it's applicable. You're also required to have daylighting, again, where it's applicable. For the daylighting specifically, you're probably not going to have any daylighting in a motion picture theater, so that wouldn't apply to you. But if you did, you'd be required to control it. The add ones and add twos, uh, for example, again, for motion picture theater, you are required to have either restricted um, lighting turn on to manual on only, or you must restrict it to only partial automatic on. And there are references in each of these cells to the section in the code where it describes in more detail. Going over to the far right, you have an add two. This means you have to have either automatic full off or scheduled shut off. The adds, you can choose between one or the other. And that's the way the table goes uh, all, all the way through all the different space types. And of course, there are exemptions here and there. You need to uh, read each of these sections to understand what the code actually uh, says about the control. So uh, in summary, each space is required to have, and this is for IECC 2015 and 94.1-2013, either required to have or limited by one or more control functions. And I just showed you the table. These are all the controls, local on off, manual on, and that's one of the limited by um, items. Partial automatic on, which is typically occupancy or timer based. Partial automatic off, this is that new one, which is not used in IECC 2015, but is in 2013, but only applies to a few spaces. Automatic full off, Bi-level control, scheduled automatic off, and this, as you saw, is one of those. Usually, as an add one or add two, you, you have two choices. And daylighting controls for side lighting and top lighting. So I'd like to go through some of these that maybe um, need a little more explanation. Occupancy-based or timer shutoff control. 90.1 2013 requires uh, either occupancy incident sensor or automatic, not manual, but automatic timer scheduled shutoff. In most spaces, there are some exceptions. 2015 IECC looks at it similarly but in a different way. They specify a limited list where occupancy sensors must be used, and then in the rest of the places, you have to use an automatic timer shutoff control. Similar uh, look at it, but a different way to do it. So effectively, 2013 uh, gives you more of a choice, but you still they still have to be automatic uh, turnoffs for for most every space that you have in the building, with certain exceptions. There are always exceptions. The, man, the occupancy manual on control restriction, which was, was one of those in the list, both codes require that the devices must, be, uh, must not be set to turn automatically full on. A typical <laughs> occupancy sensor is usually set to turn everything on, and that's not allowed. You have to have it set so that it can be manually turned on or at most 50% auto on. This has been shown to save a lot of energy because a lot of times you don't need full on or even to turn the lights on if you're popping into an office shortly to drop something off, for example. There are exceptions to this where full auto is on, and here's a list of those, the places where it really needs to be auto on or has a safety issue. Those are exempted in both codes. If we look at bi-level space flight control, which has been in energy codes for a long time, 
Uh, it's kind of been modified to provide multiple steps or at least one control step between 30 and 70 percent plus full on and off. It applies to a lot of the spaces in 2013. In 2015, they stated it's only those spaces with timer control. So in IECC 2015, if you have an occupancy sensor already, you don't have to have bi-level control. But if you only have a timer control, then you do. And there are exemptions. Um, note there's a first set here with corridors, mechanical rooms, lobbies, restrooms, stairway, storage rooms. Uh, IECC 2015 differs in that they do not exempt restrooms, stairways, and storage rooms. They still require it in those, place, in those places. And the other two, space with only one luminaire and space with low lighting card densities are exempted. Again, because it, it, it wouldn't be cost effective to put it in those spaces. Partial auto off is the new control in 2015. And it was put in realizing that in some places you really can't have full off. And stairwells have become one of them because of uh, security issues in the, in the past. So this partial auto off control is put in to at least provide some shut off to some spaces, but not turn it all the way down for security issues. IECC 2015 doesn't have this at this point, so they either exempt it from control altogether or require or still require it full off. Now this is one area where we know that state or local e requirements may have an issue. They may overshadow that. But of course energy codes have a provision in them that says if there are any other life health safety requirements, the energy code uh, gives way to that. So that should cover that issue. Daylighting control for both top lighting and side lighting. Um, electric lighting must be controlled when there is daylight available. And made available when possible, at least in one situation. So what that means is if you have top and side daylight, you have to have uh, electric lighting control if the space is large enough, et cetera. And we'll talk about that. Also, if you have a large enough area that's directly under a roof, you're required to have a certain amount of skylights. Again, certain conditions and exceptions apply. And then once those skylights are in, then of course you have to control it. So it's a little more detail on that. Uh, for top lighting, it's applied to this daylight area under skylights plus daylight area under rooftop monitors. Basically, there's a defined daylight area. If your space meets this criteria, then you have to control it. But only if you have over 150 watts of lighting in that space. If you have less than 150 watts, you don't have to meet the requirement. The control is required um, only for the general area, general lighting in the area. Um, if you have some task lighting, it wouldn't necessarily apply to that, but all the general lighting in that area. And the control must be either multi-level photo control, at least two output levels, or continuous dimming. That choice is, is up to you. Sometimes it may make, sense, may make sense to do one or the other. If we look at this graphically, this is a top view or a plan view. If you're looking down on, say, a warehouse area, you've got two skylights and three vertical shelving obstructions, we'll call them. In the far left case with that skylight, the wall is the boundary of the daylight area. Top and bottom, it extends to the full length. And there's a calculation for it. I won't go into that deep, but there's a calculation based on the skylight area and height that tells you how far that daylight area is. And to the right, that area is blocked by this vertical obstruction, which is high enough to block the light. So that light gray area becomes the daylight area you have to control. On the right-hand skylight, if you look to the, to the left-hand side, there's an obstruction there, but it's really close to the skylight. And it's not tall enough to block all the light. So a lot of the light from the skylight will bleed over the obstruction, so the, the daylight area extends out to its full extent. Again, top and bottom, it goes to the full extent. To the right, it also goes to the full extent because the obstruction is far enough away, it's not going to block anything. So that's kind of how the, the calculation works. Um, and again, you see there's a note at the bottom, if you have a side lighted area from some windows, you don't have to double count. You only have to do that. So if we look at control for side lighting, again, if you have any side lighting daylight, it must be controlled. Again, the limit is 150 watts. If you have less than 150 watts, you don't have to do it. Similar control requirements in terms of multi-level or, or uh, continuous dimming. And if we look at a schematic, again, we're looking at a plan view as if you pasted yourself to the ceiling and you're looking down onto this office. You've got two windows. You have less than four feet wide between the windows. If it was more than four feet wide, it would be considered two different daylight areas. In this case, it's all one contiguous one. 
and it extends out quite a ways to the right, but you'll notice there are some partitions in the upper corner there, and those partitions are high enough, based on the calculation, that they block the light. So not enough light spills over them, so the control area is only within that area, within that section of those partitions. So again, there's a set of formulas that work for this, but this is kind of how it gets applied. So that primary sidelight area is what, we, what, what must be controlled. Interior parking garage control. This is something relatively new for 90.1 2013. There's a realization that a lot of interior underground parking garages are lit 24-7. A lot of them, because they are used 24-7, but a lot of them are specific to an office park, for example, and they are essentially empty after hours and not used, the lights are on. So the requirement is that you have to at least reduce the lighting by 30% in lighting zones less than or equal to 3,600 square feet. This way, at least there is some light in case someone's working late in the building, but it's not on at full power. There is an exemption for daylight transition zones. So as we know, when we come into a dark parking garage from sunlight or vice versa, uh, we need to, our eyes need to adapt. So there are exemptions for those spaces. And there's also a requirement for daylight. So some parking garages have some walls that are half walls or walls with openings in them. And if there's enough daylight coming through, you have to have daylight shut off as well. And of course, there are exceptions. Now, I do want to note this is also not something that's in IECC 2015. It may be in the future, but it's currently not a requirement in there. <coughs> looking graphically at this requirement, here's one that kind of shows again, this is a view looking down on a, on a on one floor of a parking garage, and there's a 3,600 square foot control zone. You've got two entry exits which are exempted. They have their own requirements. And you have two open walls with the dotted lines to the right and to the bottom. On the bottom, it's an open wall. It has enough of an opening. There's daylight in it, so you have to have control within 20 feet, that other little dotted line. To the right, there's no daylight control zone, and that's because there's a building adjacent to it within 20 feet that's tall enough that it blocks significant sunlight, so there's no requirement. So if we look at the daylight control requirement in terms of the opening in the wall, there's also a calculation for that. Here we have two floors, and you have to have a wall, and this is floor by floor, that has openings at least 40% of the total. So on the top floor, it's pretty obvious that's going to be 40%. The bottom floor, maybe not. It's Less than half of it has openings in it, and those openings are probably, um, you know, maybe three quarters of the of the wall section. So that may not meet the requirement. So you may not have to have daylighting in the bottom floor, but you would have to have it in the top floor in this case. Exterior lighting control has always been in the energy codes, but it's a lot of times been fairly simple. Maybe just photo shut off for parking lots. That's been advanced quite a bit. The, the dust to dawn photo cell shut off there, but now there are requirements for facade and landscape lighting to be off from midnight or the closing of the business to either 6 a.m. or the opening of the business. And this is the realization that facade and landscape lighting is an important part of the look of the building, but it's not necessarily needed when the building isn't being occupied or patronized. However, signage, that's the other category, signage and other lighting um, can still remain on because you want your business, people to know where your business is and what's offered there, but it has to be reduced by at least 30% after hours or when it's unoccupied. This way it still remains lit up and at night it's going to be very visible, but you don't have to have it on full on when there's nobody patronizing your business. And of course there are exceptions that apply. You'll need to read those in the code. And this applies to both. Um, both codes. There's another provision in 90.1 that allows some credit for advanced control. So if you put in a really good control that's not required, you can get some credit. So after you've met all the mandatory requirements that are, that are placed in the standard, you can then get additional power if you put in some advanced control. It's based on control of a specific space only or spaces. You only get to calculate your allowance based on that space. But again, the, whatever credit you get, you can then use the credit anywhere. But you can only base the calculation of the credit on the spaces you're going to control. And it's a simple calculation of the lighting power of this advanced control system times a control factor. 
and that will get you in a, a bucket of, another small bucket of watts you can use anywhere else. Now the options are limited. There used to be more of them, but of course more controls are now required. So it, it's limited, and they do reflect some very advanced systems that are, tend to be, you know, you have to spend more money to do them. They're usually fully automatic or programmable, or they apply to secondary spaces. So they're, they're tough to get, but if you need some extra watts, it's one way to get. Again, these are not part of IECC 2015. They chose not to include this table. And here's a, a part of the table from 2013. On the far left is the control method, and some of them get, get very detailed in terms of programmable multi-level dimming kind of things or, or um, automatic systems where it's not automatic um, in, the, in the main part of the code, code or multi-level occupancy sensors instead of on-off, these kind of things. And over to the right, you have the space types. And again, it's limited. To you can't apply this everywhere. It's got to be just in these space types. And the numbers you see in here are conservative. But when these were calculated, there was a, an analysis done of, hey, what can this control save in this space type? And then a number which created that do an allowance less than what that total you would save is. So you're not getting everything back, but you're getting a uh, of it back. So again, who, whoever's on the phone, if you haven't muted your phone, please mute it because we're getting um, some other background noise. Thank you. Uh, alterations requirements, big part of energy code compliance because a lot of building is done with uh, alterations, well, not new. Um, basically, retrofit projects must comply with the uh, uh, lighting power limits. This includes retrofits where luminaires are either added, replaced, or removed. So we almost any kind of a lighting retrofit. Um, in for 2013, when you do an alteration, you also have to apply basic auto shutoff control, just the basic shutoff. IECC requires full lighting compliance of the entire section, which could include some other controls as well. That's one difference between two. In 2013, the current requirement is if you have an alteration of less than 10% of a space, you don't have to comply. It used to be 50% in 90.1. IECC, um, for some reason, both of those exception notes in there, I'm not sure why they're both included. They're in the same general area, but in different sections. So that's something that maybe needs to be straightened out. And one other note that, uh, at least for 90.1, this is not included in IECC or specifically spelled out, but for 90.1-2013, if you are replacing the lamps and the ballast, in a fluorescent trough, for, for example, that's considered a retrofit. If you're just replacing the lamps, that's maintenance. You don't have to comply. If you're just replacing the ballast because it died or whatever, that's considered maintenance. You don't have to comply. If you're doing both in the same luminaire, that's an alteration you have to comply with. Functional testing is also uh, required in both the codes. The idea is you want to make sure these, especially with new additional control requirements, you want to make sure the controls are working as advertised uh, before the building is turned over. In 2013, there's a requirement that this functional testing or calibration must not be done by this exact same people who did the design, manufacture, installation, um, just to make sure there's no problem. <coughs> IECC 2015 only specifies that, that the design professional in charge of the part of the building must verify the controls perform as designed. Little slight difference there. Um, the primary focus of the functional testing section is the same in both. It's for occupancy sensors, time switches, and daylight control photo sensors. And there's a whole list of step-by-step -step -step instructions for each of those three that talks about varying finding performance, uh, confirming the timeout sensitivity settings, um, confirming the programming, and confirming that photo cells work correctly. And these are all important, as we know, for controls, especially in daylighting controls, to make sure it functions the way it's supposed to be. If it doesn't, it'll either get deactivated or you won't get the energy savings. So it's a very important part of the standard, and there are detailed instructions for each of these in those sections. That basically covers all the requirements for um, the lighting section, but I want to spend a little bit of time on the power requirements because those are included in both 90.1 and IECC. The basic requirements are um, for low voltage dry transformer uh, Efficiency, which effectively just must meet EPAC 2005 requirements. It's pretty standard. That's what all um, transformers are kind of designed to meet, and so it's pretty straightforward to, to meet that one. There is a voltage drop 
for efficiency purposes requirement in 90.1-2013. It's not included in IECC. Currently, it's 2% um, uh, of design load in feeder circuits and 3% in branch circuits. That will probably change in the future, but that's the way it currently is. And again, this is with an eye towards when you design it, you want to be as efficient as possible with potential voltage drop losses. So, um, there's also a requirement in 90.1-2013 for automatic receptacle control for a percentage of receptacles in certain space types, not by ECC 2015, and I'll talk about that a little bit. There are also requirements in both for electric metering, talk about that a little bit, and both require um, document submittals, drawings and manuals, et cetera, et cetera, for terminals. So if we look at the receptacle wall flood control requirements of the team, um, it applies to a portion of receptacles in a space, not all of them. It applies essentially to 50% of the standard 125 volt, 15 and 20 amp receptacles, and only in these spaces, private office conference room, print copy rooms and break rooms, open office workstations, computer classrooms, those space types only, and it also applies to 25% of modular furniture circuits. So if you have a design build office facility, you don't have the furniture moved in yet, but you have modular furniture circuits going out to the middle of the floor, you have to have 25% of those in some fashion controllable. It could be 25% to each furniture station or 25% of the stations, that's kind of left up to you, but it has to be 25% of those circuits. With the realization, again, that a lot of spaces are built without the tenants moved in yet, so that you would capture at least those modular furniture circuits. The control must be an automatic control. So automatic time of day scheduling, occupancy sensor, or something else that's occupancy based. Again, there, there are different options there. There are exceptions, of course, for safety security, or if it's a space that requires 24 hour electrical use, then that portion would be exempted. Yeah, there's also a requirement that the controlled receptacles must be marked and uniformly distributed. So you can't put them all on one side of the room, they've got to be some uniform distribution. And they must be marked in some way. And there are some uh, electrical industry requirements uh, that have been developed for, for marking these, and you would use that. The, the energy code doesn't specify how to mark it. They leave it up to you to use industry standards for that. One other point I really want to make is that in-type devices comply with this. And by plug-in, there will be power strips or, or modules that cover the receptacle that are plugged in and have one that's controllable um, right there at the plug-in. If it isn't a permanently hardwired part of the building, then it doesn't comply. And we've had several interpretation requests on this, including ones for something that um, is a plug-in that has a screw to hold it on to the receptacle. That doesn't comply either. That's not considered permanently installed because it's easy to unscrew. So plug-in type devices do not comply with this requirement, at least at this point. And again, these uh, this requirement is not included as as a part of the EC 2015. We look at electrical energy use monitoring. Um, again, this is for new construction only. <coughs> There's a requirement for separate measurements for total electric, HVAC electric, interior and exterior lighting separately, and receptacle circuits so that users can see where the energy is being used. If you have tenants in a building, um, each tenant has to have its own uh, set of these um, parts monitored um, if it's possible to do so. Now, there's a realization that sometimes the building is built without tenants or with, without the knowledge that there will be more than one tenant, and so it would only have one meter. Later on, if the space is reconfigured and that doesn't uh, trigger any code requirement, then you may still have one meter. But in the beginning, if you have multiple tenants, you have to have them separately metered. There are requirements for recording and data availability. It's important that each of the uh, tenants have a, have that data available to them so they can make good energy use choices. There are some exceptions, of course. If the building's too small, less than 25,000 square feet, or a tenant's too small, less than 10,000 square feet, you don't have to comply. Or if it's a dwelling unit. So in 90.1-2013, if you have a high-rise building that's considered um, part of the 90.1-2013 requirements, the dwelling units themselves do not have to have any metering. There's also an exception, again, for a high-rise residential, for example, that has less than 10,000 square feet of common area. They don't have to meet that either. 
And if you have critical emergency branch circuits defined within NEC 517, 517 those don't have to be metered either. 2015, I mentioned up above, does have meter requirements, but they don't have any specified requirements for the commercial part of the building. But if you have dwelling units in a commercial building, high rise residential, for example, those do have to have a meter. So kind of an opposite system here. One requires metering in all the non-dwelling spaces, and one requires it in the dwelling spaces. Both have value. Each of the codes looked at it differently in terms of how their code is applied. There is another additional IECC 2015 requirement that is not in 90.1. This is something else that IECC requires for all projects. It's the additional efficiency package requirement. <clears throat> so essentially what it says is that once you're done with complying with everything else, you must then pick one additional feature and comply with that. And currently they have six options. More efficient HVAC, reduced lighting power density, enhanced lighting controls, on-site renewable, dedicated outdoor air system, <clears throat> excuse me, or a more efficient uh, water heating system. So the two I want to look at, of course, are the lighting ones. And historically, uh, even when this list was shorter, um, lighting tends to be one of the easier things to comply with, or at least a lot of people believe it is, and so it was kind of a primary target. So I want to press both of these. The first one would be reduced lighting power. And it basically says if you're using the whole building method, you've got to use only 90% of what's in the main tables. If you're using the space-by-space -space method, you only get to use 90% of that. That seems pretty straightforward. 90% is only a 10% reduction. Doesn't seem too bad. But as I explained earlier on about um, how the um, lighting power densities were developed, they're developed based on saving as much energy as possible and still providing enough light to do good quality design. In a lot of spaces, maybe, especially if you're using LED, maybe 90% is no big deal, easy to do. In some spaces, it may not be as easy. So there's a caution here of using this one, 90%. Uh, if you can meet that and still meet good lighting quality design and IES recommendations, that's great. But in some cases, you may not be able to do that, in which case you have to pick another feature. One of those might be the enhanced digital lighting controls. And for this one, you basically required to have luminaires that are capable of continuous dimming. That's kind of a core part of this. And then the luminaires need to be capable of being addressed with some kind of control system either individually or tied as a group of uh, less than or equal to four luminaires. For daylight zones, it's less than or equal to eight luminaires. This gives more advanced control function, so you can reduce light levels when it's not needed, needed in areas of the building. The fixtures uh, must be controlled through a digital system, and that control must do a whole bunch of things. Um, allow for control reconfiguration. Um, based on where the fixture is in the space, so they're all digitally addressed to their location. They must have a <coughs> fitting. They must hmm. have um, uh, individual user control of the overhead general illumination. So, a person sitting under a certain amount of a certain um, portion of light in their office area, they must have some kind of general illumination control over that. And the occupancy sensors that are part of this system. Um, must be capable of being reconfigured through the digital system, so you don't have to go up to each fixture and do it, do it manually. That's kind of the lay of, of how that affects. <clears throat> now, that seems like a lot of stuff to put into a control system, and it is. However, there are a lot of newer systems that have all this already in them, and they're being sold and marketed, quite a few of them. It, again, it's an extra cost, but that's why it's uh, the additional efficiency package. So. Um, Kind of next to last, just a few words about compliance. As I mentioned, DOE uh, requires adoption of codes, but it's the state and local jurisdictions that monitor the compliance. Once a state has adopted a code or a local jurisdiction, and there are states where local jurisdictions adopt a specific code on their own, whether their state has one or not, they're the ones that monitor compliance. And they have building departments and building inspectors, et cetera. We're all familiar with that. Of course, we also know that codes just aren't perfect. Your project may be odd in some way. It doesn't quite fit the requirements. And so maybe you need an interpretation. Uh, maybe you don't have time for an interpretation, so you're at the mercy of the building official. And I'm sure you've all um, been at that point. But the point I'm trying to make is that the building official isn't there out to get you. They're just as frustrated sometimes and interested in coming up with a reasonable application as you are. A lot of the questions we get on the, on the help support line are from building officials who are trying to understand it just like the builder is. So what we have found is that 
um, you're really trying to work to the intent of the requirement. You want to follow it to the letter of the law. Sometimes maybe you can't do that, but if you work with the building official and offer some kind of good effective solution for that, that has been um, proven to be very successful. So that's, that's one suggestion I would give to you is, is uh, try to work with your building official. You may find a, an easy path. So here are some links um, to the Building Energy Codes program itself, to uh, the help desk I mentioned. If you have a specific question about something, about some software products or the code, you can send in a question. Uh, I will give you the, the standard caveat here. Um, Building Energy Codes program through DOE is not ASHRAE or IECC, so can't provide official interpretations, but have lots and lots of experience with the code so we can help steer you in the right direction or show you where you can get interpretation. There's a link here for the certificate of attendance, for self-reporting, and there's my name and contact. If you can't get some help everywhere else, anywhere else, I will try and help where I can. Um, so now we can go to questions, and I know uh, a lot of them have been coming in, and Pam has handed me some here. I'm going to go through these as quickly as I can and answer as many as I can. And it turns out we have quite a bit of time left, so this is good. Um, the first one, um, why aren't costs factored into development of LPDs? I didn't mention costs. They are factored in. Um, it's not necessarily a specific calculation, but one of the parts of the process is to look at the products that we use as one of the inputs to the LPD calculation. So what happens is we collect, for example, if we're looking at a, a two by four trough or fixture type we want to use in a bunch of different models, we'll collect a whole bunch of information on all kinds of two by four trough or products, fluorescent and in the case for the next version of the code LED, and we'll look at um, them as a whole. We'll throw out ones that are really not very efficient, We'll throw out ones that are maybe just fancy versions of another one that are very expensive. <clears throat> we'll look at those that are kind of good and efficient, but middle of the road cost, and use those as the basis of the LPD. Now, there has been some work where we looked individually at space types and took a typical efficient fixture of various types and put those into the um, put those into the into an, an analysis and determined that for that space type and several of them, it was cost effective. So we have been careful to only include products that are reasonably priced. Now what happens when you have a new LPD is that the cost actually goes down because you're using less fixtures. So it's been easy to show that they are cost effective. But there is um, reference to cost effectiveness. Now um, it depends on which fixture you choose. Um, you're left to that um, device yourself. But in general, we have shown that, that the LPDs are reasonably cost effective. And that includes LEDs when those get in a newer version. Same process. Uh, another question here, will a space type be added that includes plant growth facilities? These are growing in many states and there's no code LPD limiting energy use. Good question. Yes, uh, at least in 90.1, the committee has had long, lengthy discussions about adding plant uh, growth facilities. There is a um, plant growth exception in one of the exceptions, the 18 exceptions, you want to look at that. Um, that will either be modified or traded for, likely in the future, modified or <coughs> traded for an, for growth facilities. So that will be something that happens in the future. So it has, yes, it is being looked at. Um, could we get the reference to calculations of daylight spread on the floor of a building? Yeah, there is a calculation method. If you go to the, um, uh, the actual code book itself, It'll show you what that formula is. There's also there are also two companion documents on the BEC website. One that goes into more detail about 90.1/2013. One that goes into more detail about IECC 2015. There might be more information in there that you can use, but the fallback is the code itself because that has all the complete drawings and there's a couple more drawings than what I showed you and the complete formula. So look for the code for that. Another one here, does the functional testing section identify what credentials the individual must have in order to test? Um, um, there is some language, but it's fairly generic. There isn't a specific certificate that you have to have, and I'm struggling with the requirements right now. But again, go to the code. The code will tell you exactly what it intends for you to have. And I know there was a lot of discussion around that, struggling with what to require. So it is somewhat generic. 
um, but there is some language. You'll, you'll have to read that um, yourself. And it does differ between IECC and 20 and 9.1-2013. So you want to look at each of those. Let's see. Another question. I believe the voltage drop requirement has been changed to 5% for the whole system. Uh, um, similar proposals, 5% recommended for approval is the ICC group. That's true. For 9.1-2016, it will be 5% for the total system, and I think that will probably follow suit in other codes. This, of course, is just on IECC, I'm, I'm sorry, on 9.1-2013 and IECC-2015. Currently, it's at 2% and 3%. But yes, you're correct. That is being changed to a 5% total. Uh, another question. What about a new addition, but where metering is not being changed? As we get power from existing service, are we required to separate separate meter the HVAC? Um, if it's a new addition, it typically needs to meet the requirements of the entire code. And um, you would then have to tie that metering into, well, that's, that's a good question. Um, you would have to talk to your building official about that one. Um, if the metering is not being changed, if you don't have metering in the existing part of the building, you may be required to add it, although there's part of the code that says you shouldn't have to change things that are already there. So you may be required to put metering in that part of the building, particularly if it's a new tenant. But if it's a new tenant, um, without getting an interpretation, I'd say you have to talk to your building official. You can also send an official interpretation into, into 90.1 or IECC, and they will be able to address this for you. I'm just not comfortable with saying one way or the other because I'm not sure at this point. But that's a very good question. Um, another question here, what is intended to control unplugged wall receptacles? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by unplugged. They, the control requirement is to say that 50% of them have to be controlled by something like an occupancy sensor. The other 50% are not controlled. It's up to the user to decide which is appropriate. There may be something that has to be on all the time. It gets plugged into one and things that can be off. Um, printers and other peripheral office equipment, those go in the other one. Let's see. Um, that's what I have so far in terms of questions, unless um, I see some more come in, and I put the, the links back up here on the on the screen. So by all means, if you do have questions that didn't get answered, uh, please go to the BECP help desk link, and there's a way you can uh, ask a question. But even before that, if, if you like, go to the um, Building Energy Codes program. There are lots of training resources out there. I specifically mentioned one um, that's dedicated to 90.1 2013 goes into more detail, and one that's dedicated to, 90, or to IECC 2015. Those will provide more detail than I was available to provide here. So at that point, I'll turn it over to Pam, I believe. Thank you, Eric, for taking the time to tell us about all the information on lighting code requirements today. And uh, we really do appreciate it. If you, again, if you still have questions, you can submit them through the help desk uh, through Building Energy Codes. And thank you, attendees, and all of you now can disconnect. <laughs>